Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School Lesson for the third quarter of 2024. Welcome to the reading of Lesson number 6 of the Sabbath School Lessons on the Book of Mark. This lesson is titled Inside Out and is ready for teaching on August 10. The author is Dr. Thomas R. Shepherd of Andrews University, and your reader today is Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, August 3. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, it's fascinating going through the Gospel of Mark as we follow the story of Jesus and his interaction with people, as he shares his love, his power and his grace with those around him, as he teaches. And as we, this week, study these important lessons, we pray that we may be teachable, that what Jesus taught may be a blessing to us, to our families and to those that we interact with. And Lord, today I'd like to particularly pray for Diana G and her children and her studies, and Joyce Atata who's seeking employment, and Nadine Murray's daughter and friend in Guyana in South America. And Lord, Ital Dia and Diagni, or Diane, I'm not sure how uh, that is spelt. Lord, I just pray that their needs may be satisfied. And today for Carrie and Cameron Hamilton, and those who work at the Northern Caribbean University, Lord, I'd like to also pray, and each of us to pray, for all of our multiple Seventh-day Adventist universities on every continent, particularly for the staff, the students, and the graduates, Lord, and the influence they have in the community, the influence they have in our church, that they produce leaders, Lord, and we just thank you for the work and the sacrifice that goes in to providing these educational institutions. Lord, be with us now as we open your word, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Mark chapter 7 and verse 15. There is nothing that enters a man from outside that can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. And Dr. Dirk, a senior medical colleague of mine, will read it a second time. I am Dirk from Harvey Bay, and our memory verse is from Mark chapter 7, verse 15. There is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. Mark chapter 7, verse 15. This week's study is Mark 7 and the first half of Mark 8. At the beginning of Mark 7, Jesus stirs up controversy by rejection of religious tradition. However, he does it in a way that is strikingly supportive of something deeply relevant to Christian life today. Jesus then presents a riddle that opens the door to a true understanding of what faith is really about. After this, he goes to Tyre and Sidon and has an encounter with a woman who was the only person in the Gospels to win an argument with Jesus. His encounter with her is unusual, and underneath it there are a few secret communications the woman picked up on. And because of her faith, Jesus granted her request. Mark 7, with another healing, reveals the important truth that, however impressive miracles can be, they alone are often not enough to open hearts to truth. After all, what good did the miracles do for the religious leaders who were bent on rejecting Jesus? In Mark 8, the study looks at the significance of bread as a symbol of teachings and traditions. These stories contain great lessons about the meaning and practice of religious life. Sunday, August 4. Human Traditions versus God's Commands. Read Mark 7, verses 1 to 13. What relevant truths are presented here? So we begin at Mark 7 and verse 1. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. 
The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law ask Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders, instead of eating their food with defiled hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written, These people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And he continued, You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, Honour your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corban, that is, devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus, you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many things like that. One can imagine children studying this passage in Sabbath school and coming home to tell their mothers that they do not have to wash their hands before eating because Jesus said so. However, this story is not about hygiene. In Jesus' day, many people in that land were very concerned with ritual purity. During the time between the Testaments, the idea of washing hands in order to remain ritually pure was extended to common people, even though these rules originally applied only to the priests in the Old Testament, as we read in Exodus chapter 30, verses 17 to 21. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a bronze basin with its bronze stand for washing. Place it between the tent of meeting and the altar, and put water in it. Aaron and his sons are to wash their hands and feet with water from it. Whenever they enter the tent of meeting, they shall wash with water so that they will not die. Also, when they approach the altar to minister by presenting a food offering to the Lord, they shall wash their hands and feet so that they will not die. This is to be a lasting ordinance for Aaron and his descendants for the generations to come. It is in keeping with this concept that the religious leaders complain to Jesus about his disciples. Jesus does not directly answer the question asked of him. Instead, he defends his disciples in a two-pronged response. First, he quotes Isaiah's strong words, rebuking a nation that honours God in word, but whose heart is far from him. And that's Isaiah twenty nine thirteen. The Lord says, These people come near to me with their mouth and honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on mere human rules they have been taught. The quotation from Isaiah continues with the condemnation of putting human traditions in the place of divine commands. The second part of Jesus' reply plays off the Isaiah quotation. The Lord cites the command of God to honour one's parents. That is, to take care of them in their old age and contrast this with a religious tradition where one could give something to God, a gift, Corbin, use it for oneself, but deny its use to elderly parents in need. One can just imagine the encounter, I am sorry, Father, I would love to help you, but I gave the money to the temple. And that was in light of Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. Honour your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. It is this type of hypocrisy that Jesus attacks uncompromisingly. They have placed human tradition above the word of God, and in so doing, have sinned. So, what was the answer to the Pharisees' question? The response of Jesus implies that 
he does not find convincing their insistence on hand purification as necessary to be in accordance with the will of God. Instead, his response clearly supports the commandments of the law over against human tradition. And we have four sets of texts to look at here. And the first is Mark chapter 1, verse 44. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. And Mark 7, verses 10 and 11. For Moses said, Honour your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corban, that is, devoted to God. And Mark 10, verses 3 to 8, What did Moses command you? He replied. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law, Jesus replied. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. And Mark 12, verse 26. Now, about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the account of the burning bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? and the same chapter, Mark 12, verses 29 to 31. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbour as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And so to finish today, Might we have some traditions that perhaps conflict with the principles of God's law? If so, what might they be? Monday, Monday, August 5. Clean hands or clean heart? Read Mark chapter 7, verses 14 to 18. What did Jesus mean by the riddle in Mark 7, verse 15? Mark 7, beginning at verse 14. Again Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he asked, don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them, for it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach, and then out of the body? In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. Jesus' words in this passage have been a conundrum for many as they ponder their relationship to the teachings of Leviticus 11 regarding clean and unclean foods. Is Jesus doing away with such distinctions? Are Seventh-day Adventists mistaken in teaching that church members who eat meat are to eat it only from the clean animal list? First, It would be odd for Jesus suddenly to dismiss Mosaic instruction in Mark 7, 14, 19 when he had just offended Moses against tradition in Mark 7, verses 6 to 13. Second, the very tradition that the Pharisees were promoting does not have a basis in Old Testament teaching. The food laws, in contrast, do. Third, What Mark 7.19 means when it says that Jesus cleanses all food is not that the food laws are abolished, but instead that the tradition of touch contamination that the Pharisees had made was invalid. This, for example, is that false notion that if you could be contaminated by coming in contact with Gentiles, then you also could be contaminated through contact with food that they had touched. Read Mark chapter 7, verses 20 to 23. 
What did Jesus say causes contamination of a person? Beginning at verse 20, he went on. What comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. In Mark 7.19, Jesus notes that food does not go into the heart but into the stomach and then passes out through the intestinal tract. But in Mark 7.21-23, he notes that evil comes from inside the heart, from the centre of who a person is. He presents a list of vices that start from evil thoughts but then end in evil actions. When the reference to the fifth commandment in Mark 7.10 is included with the vice list, every commandment of the second table of the Decalogue is there. Further, Jesus refers to vain worship in Mark 7.7, the breaking of what is at the heart of the first four commands of the Decalogue. Thus, Jesus stands as a defender of the law of God throughout this passage. And so to finish the day, You might have the right theology, but who fully and ultimately has your heart? Tuesday, August 6, Crumbs for the Dogs Read Mark chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. What important lessons are found in this story? Mark 7, beginning at verse 24. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, Let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Following on the heels of the challenging passage in yesterday's study, the story in this passage also raises troubling questions. Why does Jesus respond so harshly to this woman, in so many words, calling her a dog? He does not openly explain, but two characteristics in his response to her suggest what he is teaching. Mark 7.27 says that the children should be fed first. If there is a first, it seems logical that there would be a second. The other characteristic is that Jesus uses a diminutive form of the word dog, not meaning puppies, but rather in context, dogs allowed inside the house in contrast to street dogs. The woman picks up on these two markers in her response to Jesus, which helps explain her response. The woman's response is rather pointed. She replies, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs, in verse 28. How did this woman come up with this response to Jesus? Certainly, the love for her daughter drove her forward, but Jesus also encouraged her. He said, first, implying there could be a second. Furthermore, he implied she was a dog under the table. Just as the dog was in the house under the table, so she was at Jesus' feet, pleading for her daughter. So she claimed a dog's right to the food that fell on the floor. The woman's response reveals her faith. Calling the mighty miracle of healing her daughter from a distance a crumb indicated both that Jesus' power was especially great. If such a miracle were a crumb what would a whole loaf be? And that granting her request was a small matter for him. Jesus was moved, 
and granted her request. In the Desire of Ages, page 401, we read, By his dealings with her, he has shown that she who has been regarded as an outcast from Israel is no longer an alien, but a child in God's household. As a child, it is her privilege to share in the Father's gifts. End of quote. And so to finish today, why is prejudice against other races and nationalities contrary to the teaching of Jesus? How can we seek to be purged of this evil? Wednesday, August 7, Tongue-Tied Read Mark chapter 7, verses 31 to 37. Who was brought to Jesus, and what did Jesus do for him? We read in verse 31 onwards in Mark chapter 7, Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon, down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephrata, which means be opened. At this the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Jesus did not take the shortest distance to return to Galilee from the region of Tyre and Sidon. It seems Jesus went north from the area of Tyre, up through the region of Sidon, then inland and down through the area northeast of the Sea of Galilee, finally arriving near the sea itself. It was a circuitous route, likely with additional time for him to teach his disciples. The text does not indicate exactly who brought the man to Jesus, but his problem was plain enough. He could not hear and had difficulty speaking. Loss of hearing isolates people from their surroundings and a profound deafness can make it challenging to learn how to speak. This man's problem may have been long-standing. Jesus understands the man's predicament and takes him aside privately. The Lord's manner of healing the man is curious, particularly for modern readers. He puts his fingers in the man's ears, spits, touches his tongue and sighs. Jesus touches the affected parts of the man that he will heal, but why the sigh? He sighed, we read in The Desire of Ages, page 404, at thought of the ears that would not be open to the truth, the tongues that refused to acknowledge the Redeemer. End of quote. Jesus miraculously restored the man's hearing and enabled him to speak clearly. His sigh illustrates the limits that God has placed upon himself in regards to the free choice of humanity. He will not force the will. All humans are free to choose whom they will have lead their life, the Prince of Peace or the Prince of Darkness. Jesus could open deaf ears, but would not force unbelieving hearts to acknowledge his Messiahship. The brief story also illustrates what God can do for those who willingly turn to him. Perhaps you have experienced reticence at sharing your faith, feeling tongue-tied regarding just what to say. This miracle offers encouragement that the Lord Jesus can open your ears to be sensitive to others' needs and share a ready word to lift them on their journey. And so to finish today... What do you do with the gifts you have been given regarding hearing and speaking? For they are gifts. How are you using them? Thursday, August 8. Watch out for bad bread. Read Mark 8, verses 11 to 13. 
What approach by the Pharisees deeply disappointed Jesus? We read Mark chapter 8, beginning at verse 11. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. To test him, they asked for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, Why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to it. Then he left them, got back into the boat, and crossed to the other side. Why not demonstrate his divine power and convince these cavillers? The problem goes back to the end of Mark 3, where Jesus speaks of the sin against the Holy Spirit. If one's ears are shut and eyes are closed, another miracle, even a sign from heaven, will not convince. It would just be dismissed like everything before. Even miracles are not enough to convince those determined not to believe. Read Mark eight fourteen to 21 What had the disciples forgotten, and what point did Jesus make from this? Mark 8, beginning at verse 14. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, Is it because we have no bread? Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember, when I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the four thousand, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? Jesus takes the opportunity to warn the disciples against the leaven of the Pharisees and Herod in verse 15, meaning their teachings, and will compare that with Matthew sixteen twelve. Then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. But the disciples misunderstand and think that Jesus is talking about avoiding buying literal bread. As is typical when the disciples misunderstand, Jesus gives them instruction. The Lord asks a series of questions. The first several rhetorical in nature, expressing his disappointment that they have not understood his mission. His words are reminiscent of what he says in Mark four ten to 12 about outsiders who do not understand. And that reads, When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, and ever hearing but never understanding, otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. His strong words are meant to wake the disciples from their spiritual lethargy. In Mark 8, verses 19 and 20, he asks simple factual questions about how many baskets of fragments they had taken up after he fed the 5,000 in chapter 6, and we studied that last week, and also the 4,000 in Mark 8, 1 to 10. Why don't we look at that right now, so it's fresh in our minds. Mark 8, beginning at verse 1. During those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way, because some of them have come a long distance. His disciples answered, But where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. When he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people, and they did so. They had a few small fish as well. 
he gave thanks for them also and told the disciples to distribute them. The people ate and were satisfied. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 were present. After he had sent them away, he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the region of Dalmanutha. And Jesus' comments are meant to illustrate that they should have understood by now that mere limitation of resources is no barrier for the Lord's Messiah. His final question in Mark 8.21 is rhetorical once again. Do you not yet understand? After all, look at all that they had seen and experienced already with Jesus. So to finish today, how can we learn to keep our hearts and minds open to the reality of God and to his love? Dwell on all the evidence that we've been given for God and for his love. At times, though, why does it seem so easy to doubt? Friday, August 9. From the book The Desire of Ages, page 409, we read, Among the followers of our Lord today, as of old, how widespread is this subtle, deceptive sin? How often our service to Christ, our communion with one another, is marred by the secret desire to exalt self. How ready the thought of self gratulation and the longing for human approval. It is the love of self, the desire for an easier way than God has appointed, that leads to the substitution of human theories and traditions for the divine precepts. To his own disciples, the warning words of Christ are spoken. Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. The religion of Christ is sincerity itself. Zeal for God's glory is the motive implanted by the Holy Spirit. And only the effectual working of the Spirit can implant this motive. Only the power of God can banish self-seeking and hypocrisy. This change is the sign of His working. When the faith we accept destroys selfishness and pretense, when it leads us to seek God's glory and not our own, we may know that it is of the right order. Father, glorify thy name, we read in John 12:28, was the keynote of Christ's life, and if we follow him, this will be the keynote of our life. He commands us to walk even as he walked, and hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments, 1 John 2, 6 and 3. And that's the end of that quote. And that brings us to our four, five discussion questions this week. One, what Christian practices have you found that help to keep the heart clean? Two, who are the unclean people in your community? What can you do to help draw them to the gospel? Three, ponder as a class what you can do to foster sharing the gospel in simple ways with your neighbours. Four, read Mark 8 verses 1 to 10, the feeding of the 4,000. What difference does it make for the interpretation of this passage that the crowd was likely Gentile? Why shouldn't it make any difference? Let's read that. Mark 8, beginning at verse 1. During those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. His disciples answered, But where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. When he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people, and they did so. They had a few small fish as well. He gave thanks for them also and told the disciples to distribute them. The people ate and were satisfied. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 were present. After he had sent them away, he got into a boat with his disciples and went to the region of Dalmanutha. 
And the fifth question for today is, how can we diligently protect ourselves from the innate desire we all have as fallen beings to exalt ourselves? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Pleading for Father's Salvation by Andrew McChesney As a university student, Anush watched a Mexican film about a little boy who prayed for the conversion of his father. In the film, the boy said, I believe that if I pray for my father every single day, he will by all means come to God. The boy prayed every day and his father gave his heart to God. Inspired by the story, Anush decided to pray every single day for father to get baptised. She started praying four years before her own baptism. Two years after her baptism, she was still praying for him. She was sure that he would come to God. But when tensions began to simmer at home, she began to wonder how much longer she would have to wait. After her baptism, Anush became very active in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. She volunteered for church initiatives, sometimes receiving a small salary and other times nothing at all. Father didn't complain because he had given Anush permission to go to church and get baptised. Armenia is a largely patriarchal society when many fathers are the decision makers of the household. But father wanted the best for his daughter and he couldn't understand why she was working for so little. The church is using you, he said. You are talented and they are using you without giving you what you deserve. Anush began to sense tensions whenever she was at home and she didn't like it. Whenever she was invited to participate in a church program, she asked father for permission. Father allowed her to go but complained every time. Anush decided to have a heart-to-heart talk with God. God, I know that Father will come to you, but I'm so tired, she said. I'm giving you two options. Either he comes to you or he comes to you. Afterward, she told Mother, Today I'm praying earnestly to God. Join with me. We don't want this situation to continue. We want Father to go to church with us. In Armenian, Many mothers and children go to church without their husbands and fathers. Many families are comfortable with the arrangement as long as the men allow the mothers and children to go without persecution. But Anush was no longer happy with such an arrangement. She wanted father to go to church too. Mother agreed to pray. Anush's hope soared. She was sure that God would change father's heart and she was confident it could happen at any time. Part of last quarter's 13th Sabbath offering went to open a centre of influence for families like Anush's in Yerevan, Armenia. Thank you for helping spread the gospel with your offerings. Next week, we read about father forbidding Anush and mother from going to church. And I'm reading this from the balcony looking out onto the green field where I see some kangaroos popping in to say hello. Hello. 